clubs will be heading home. The other one will play on tomorrow, looking for a 2009 SEC tournament title. It's the 2009 edition of the SEC Baseball Tournament coming your way from Regent Park here in Hoover, Alabama, as LSU, the second-ranked team in the country, and the number one seed takes on the 25th-ranked South Carolina Gamecocks. Dave Neal back alongside my partner, Larry Conley. Glad you could join us on our evening game. And, Larry, we just wrapped up a, a contest between Arkansas and Florida. Florida came in as the Eastern Division champs. But this young, energetic bunch from Arkansas stays alive. And, Dave, they started seven freshmen today. A couple of them were redshirt freshmen. I, I mean, the fact that Dave Dan Van Horn rolled the dice a little bit today, he's had some injuries, and he's really been pressed into putting these freshmen into the lineup. What did they ever respond today? They could have been down and out today. Came right back and battled and won that game. And they'll play again tomorrow. And now, of course, the winner of this one coming up, LSU and South Carolina, will also play again tomorrow. But let's talk about South Carolina before we get to LSU because this Gamecock team was really struggling midway through the SEC season, Larry. They began to put it together not only on the mound, but they've been pounding the baseball. We saw that in their first game in this tournament when they had to rally late to pick up the win. They did, and they scored four runs in the 11th inning to beat an Alabama team to send them back to Tuscaloosa. Justin Dallas with this big double right here, heading down that left field line, really propelled them and got him rolling. And this is really a team that needed some help, and they got a big hit right there. They end up finishing second in the SEC Eastern Division to the South Carolina Gamecocks. Nick Ebert, one of the best hitters, certainly going in the Southeastern Conference. He'll have his hands full today, taking on LSU's Lewis Coleman, who's one of the best pitchers going. But let's talk about LSU in terms of their bats. Here's a club that had to kind of rally. The number one seed needed something good to happen. They got it last night. Well, they did, and they ran into a guy by the name of Mike Miner from Vanderbilt who beat them 4-1. to one. But then they came back with a big pinch hit home run, a three-run homer in the seventh. Derek Helenihi got a hold of this one, and it really pushed the LSU Tigers to where they are right now. You're right. They needed something positive because looking at Miner pitch all night is not a lot of fun. Well, we've got ourselves a pretty good baseball game today to wrap up what has been a, a good afternoon of baseball here on this Elimination Friday. Who will stay and who will go? We'll find out in a couple of more minutes. LSU and their faithful on hand. Lewis Coleman, their ace, trying to shut down the hot bats of South Carolina. Stay with us. First pitch and lineups around the corner. Second-ranked LSU, the top seed of the 2009 SEC tournament, taking on the South Carolina Gamecocks, who cracked the top 25 this week. There is Paul Monero of the LSU Tigers. Coach Monero has done a marvelous job since taking over for Smoke Laval, who, of course, replaced the legendary Skip Burtman over there in Baton Rouge as South Carolina takes the field to get loose for this important game. South Carolina, certainly a club that's uh, playing for a lot here in the tournament. Here's how Paul Maneri's group will go about their business offensively. DJ LeMahieu will lead things off for the LSU Tigers, followed by Ryan Schimpf. Then it's Blake Dean, who's been swinging a pretty good bat, ends up with 58 runs batted in to lead the team. Micah Gibbs behind the plate, 284. Mikey Matuk at center field, 324. Sean Ochinko at first base. Jared Mitchell out in right field, hitting seventh. Derek Hellenini at third base. And Austin Nola is your shortstop and hitting ninth. On the mound for South Carolina, Larry Nolan Belcher, the diminutive freshman. Yeah, he's a 5'8", 155-pound freshman, as you indicated, out of Augusta, Georgia. Went to Greenbrier High School. Four and three on the year. He has had one complete game so far this year. He has 15th game and 12th appearance of the season. He's got 66 strikeouts, which happens to lead this South Carolina squad. But he's also hit 10 batsmen, which also leads this South Carolina team. But this is a guy who's got a fastball in the 85 to 89 range. Curve, slider, change. He can throw all of these pitches for strikes, and he uses all of them as out pitches. He will work both sides of the plate, mixes his pitches extremely well. Uh, a guy that I think, will, if you're a hitter, you've got to be a little bit concerned because he'll keep you off balance with the kind of stuff he can throw. He just won't come to you with just one straight pitch. He may give you three or four different looks each time you go up there. Yeah, his baseball will move. There is no question that he will throw up. I don't want to say he's a junk guy, but. His ball's always going to be moving. Here's a look at that defense, Larry. And yeah, a pretty good outfield. Yeah, it is. Uh, D'Angelo Mack is in the left. Whit Merrifield on the all-defensive team in center field. Jackie Bradley Jr. in right field. 
The infield, third to first, Crisp, Haney, Wingo, and Ebert. Pretty good, pretty good infield there. Kyle Anders will do the catching of the pitches of Nolan Belcher. We showed you Belcher's numbers and we talked about him earlier. And there's a good receiver behind that plate. So the South Carolina team that lines up against a, an LSU squad that won every series they played this year except one. And that was against the University of Tennessee. They beat South Carolina two out of three. Gamecocks looking for a little revenge right now. Both of these clubs one and one. And Dave, somebody's going home after this one's over. There is Ray Tanner looking on. Nolan Belcher will throw you a lot of breaking balls, but he starts the Mayhew off with a fastball. He brought the heat on that one. Belcher, not a guy, a, a power type pitcher, as we talked about. He's, matter of fact, a young guy that early in the year, a lot of guys were questioning why Ray Tanner was hanging with him in the rotation. He was really struggling. But this Nolan Belcher is a real fighter, a scrapper out there. And I think Coach Ray Tanner and Mark Calvi, his pitching coach, realized that if they could just stay with him, get him a little confidence, here's a guy that can really do some good things for you. And that's paid off. The 1-1. One -one. There's that breaking ball that uh, doesn't have a good grip on it. Leaves it outside. South Carolina came into this tournament the hottest team in the league. They have won. They have won to this point 11 of the last 13. They had won eight in a row before they lost to Vanderbilt last night, or I should say this morning. <laughs> that was a late game. Three and two the count. Belcher has struggled a little bit on the road, but he has been very good when he's pitched at Carolina Stadium. His last outing was dynamite against the Georgia Bulldogs. And a career high in strikeouts, went double figures in that department, which followed up a great performance by Sam Dyson the night before against Georgia when he set a career high. Dyson, I think, at 13 in that game. Fly ball. That thing has hit a mile in the air. Whit Merrifield calls everybody off and puts a glove on it. One down. It's one thing about playing at Regents Park in Hoover. When you hit one up in the air in the outfield, there's a lot of room to run out there. <laughs> a lot of space. Here's Ryan Chimp stepping in. 332 on the air. 16 home runs. 54 runs batted in. 13 doubles as well. He has had a marvelous, marvelous season as the left fielder. There's a strike to Shimp, 0 and 1. There's a ground ball right back to Belcher, knocks it down, fires to first, and boy, that hit him, looked like right on the forearm on his glove hand. And it looks like he'll be all right. Let's go back and take a look at Belcher right here, getting ready to field his position, maybe more in a defensive effort than anything else. <laughs> Got that glove out there to knock it down and an easy out after he picks the ball up. It's an interesting delivery, Dave. He's, um, of course, he is so compact. I talk about the fact that he's 5'8", 155 pounds, and I might be stretching it a little bit there. But this is a young man that has a very quick delivery. I mean, once he starts into his windup, watch how quickly he goes from that one move right there, and then, then he rolls out quick. He explodes yeah, to the plate. Exactly. Here's Blake Dean. Blake struggled first half of this season, but has found his stroke. Remember that opening series we did over in Baton Rouge. Seems like forever ago, but talking to Paul Maneri, how he's, you know, this guy's got to play through it. You know, there's not a lot you do with a player like Blake Dean. Sooner or later, it's going to come around. That's. Well, he made the first team all SEC yeah. team this year and, for the second year in a row. And I'm going to tell you, back in the end of March, it didn't look like he had a chance the way he was performing. 
But, you know, that's that's one of the things I like about Paul Maneri is he didn't put a lot. There was already enough pressure on Blake Dean after the season he had last year, the All-American season. And the young man is too good not to break out of it. And the coach didn't add to the pressure. That's why he was the SEC Coach of the Year this year. He takes his team and knows exactly what he needs to do with them. Look at the numbers. I mean, if that doesn't tell you the story of Blake Dean's season, I don't know what does. First 23 versus the last 34. When he came to this tournament a year ago, he was he, he almost didn't want to pitch to him. I mean, he literally was a guy you would think about walking every time he came to the plate. Micah Gibbs on deck if Dean can reach. Out off again at the plate, three and two. But David gets back to that point that you and I talk about often during the season in baseball, at least in the college season, is the way players develop. You know, some guys come out of the gate really hot, you know, and then they cool off as the year goes on. There are other guys that start very slowly and mature and get better and and end up having better seasons at the end. That's what Dean has done this year. Then there are the other guys who are consistent throughout. I mean, from beginning to end. And their son would just aren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably won't see those guys yep, at this tournament. That's exactly There's somewhere right. else to see those guys. <laughs> Here's a ground ball. The big shift over. Wingo playing almost over there where Nick Ebert usually plays. Gets the out. One, two, three inning. Tiger fans still coming in. Great night for baseball. We played a half inning at Regents Park. Stay with us. Back at Regents Park here at Hoover, Alabama, just on the outskirts of Birmingham. Bottom of the first coming up, Ray Tanner's bunch playing some good baseball. And they've been hitting the hitting the uh, the cover off of it. I almost hate saying that's such a cliche. They've it's been hitting right. it really well. How about that? They've been hitting it really well. <laughs> Here's the group that's been hitting it very well. Whit Merrifield at 335 out in center field will lead things off for this team. Then it's D'Angelo Mack. 364. What a breakout campaign he's had. Jackie Bradley Jr., just a freshman, and Nick Ebert with 22 home runs and 71 runs batted in. Jeffrey Jones, Andrew Chris, Kyle Enders hitting seventh, Bobby Haney at short hitting eighth, and Scott Wingo hitting ninth. Larry with the defense. All right, defensively, uh, this is the way the LSU will line up. Jeff Botuk and Mitchell in the outfield. That is an outstanding outfield, by the way. Very, very fast. On the infield, Helen Ehe over at third. Nola has become a fixture at shortstop. LeMahieu down in second. Ochinko over at first. The battery tonight, Micah Gibbs behind the plate. He'll be receiving the pitches of maybe the best pitcher in the SEC, Lewis Coleman. He is 10 and 2 on the year. Those 10 wins are the most at the Southeastern Conference. He's thrown 90 in the third innings. He's given up 12 home runs this year, but his earned run average of 2.99 is second best in the SEC, and he has struck out 105 people, and that is number four in the SEC. I, I think you're safe to say that nobody's been better than Lewis Coleman this year. The young man has was a guy that I think coming into the year, you know, it was kind of the unknown. Would he be your closer, your bullpen guy with a spot start? First pitch by Merrifield, blooped in, almost grabbed by Noel, the shortstop. Good effort, but a single. Whit Merrifield's on to lead things off. Nice effort by Noel that time, but Merrifield got just enough of it to get it over his head. Oh, it went right off the edge of his glove. Merrifield, a definite threat to run. He is 13 out of 18 in stolen bases this year. And what makes it more powerful for him at first base is the fact that D'Angelo yes. Max <laughs> is at the plate, right. who also has some quickness, but really puts the ball into play. First pitch swinging. How about this? You're not going to see that double up very often. LSU had him play perfectly. Coleman got Mack to roll over on the pitch. And an easy double play for the LSU Tigers. It goes LeMahieu to Nola over to Ochinko. Outstanding. 28th double play of the year turned in by LSU. 
In fact, they're actually in the bottom three in uh, the Southeastern Conference in double plays. That time they turned it and turned it well. With the bases empty now, Jackie Bradley Jr. steps in, the freshman. Back to Coleman, though. He's a guy that, you know, I, I don't think Paul Maneri was quite sure when the season started how he was going to use Coleman. But after Coleman started just mowing down people left and right, he felt like, I got to get plenty of innings out of him. I got to get him in the rotation. And this guy has been as good as we've seen in a long time in this league. His strikeout to walk ratio, 105 to 19, is absurd. <laughs> You know the other thing too and you and I talked about this last year when we saw him again the, the, the first time we went down to uh, Baton Rouge to do that Ole Miss series. His delivery is so strange. I mean the way he lines up. He actually steps more toward third base and then comes across his body. But we'll talk more about that later. And it is very very effective. So Coleman with his hundred and sixth strikeout of the year. And the Gamecocks go down. One, two, three, folks. That's just a nasty slider. Nasty, nasty, nasty. This presentation of the 2009 SEC Baseball Tournament is brought to you by Southeast Toyota and by Humana. It's turned out to be a gorgeous night here at Regents Park. Good crowd on hand on this Friday night, Memorial Day weekend. We are here every Memorial Day weekend for SEC baseball tournament action, our 14th year. We'll have two games tomorrow, beginning at 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central Time. And then the championship game at 4 o'clock. And for those of you in our FS South area, that game will be on Sports South. A little change up for you. Braves will be on FS South on Sunday at roughly the same time. So we'll switch our tournament coverage to Sports South on Sunday. Be sure to check the listings in your particular area, however, at 4 o'clock Eastern for the championship game. As Micah Gibbs steps in, 284 on the year. Looks at a first pitch strike from Nolan Belcher. up into the seats. How about Georgia and Vanderbilt? 2 and 0 in this tournament. The teams that you, you you could argue were the the teams that were playing probably as poorly as anybody of the eight coming into this tournament, maybe even anybody in the league. And yet they come out of there both 2 and 0 taking the day off and getting ready to play tomorrow. It's a nice deal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's something to be said for struggling down the stretch. The thing for Georgia was the fact that they had struggled so much. I mean, they had only won two games coming into this tournament in the last, well, since April the 25th. They won a game against Vanderbilt and won against Georgia Tech. Everything else was losses. And I got to tell you, Vandy was just absolutely so streaky coming down the end. I mean, they starting with the with the game they had against Louisville, they won four in a row, then they lost three in a row, then they won four in a row, then they lost four in a row wow. before they won two in a row. That's what you get when you throw a bunch of freshmen and sophomores out on the field. Nice curveball from Belcher. Froze Gibbs at the plate, one down. You know, we talk about a slow curve. This is a slower curve. I mean, that ball came in there so slow. Look at that break. Oh, that is magnificent. It really just kind of froze Gibbs. I mean, he thought the ball was going to be up around his shoulders. That was a big time hook. Montuk wastes no time. He's on board with an infield single. First baseman, number 14. Ma took went right back up the middle. I thought for just a moment there that Scott Wingo was going to be able to come up with that and make a play on it, but a little too tough to handle. Yeah, the range a long way to his right. 
So one on with one down. Here's Sean Ochinko. Sean, 326 on the year. Only one guy. Actually, two guys in this LSU lineup hitting less than 300. Gibbs at 284, and Austin Nola hitting ninth at 229. And also looking at some numbers nationally, Larry, coming into this tournament. And, and usually the SEC is one of the top conferences in terms of hitting in a lot of categories, but they only have one team inside the top 80 in batting average, and that's Alabama, which ranks 22nd. I mean, that just doesn't make sense for this league well, usually. And, and I'll counter that by telling you a conversation I had with Paul Maneri when we were in Baton Rouge. I, I had asked him about, you know, having finished up, you know, the first two years in the SEC, what was your feeling about this league after having, you know, been around in Notre Dame for so many years in the Air Force Academy? And he says, you know, the first year I came in, he said, I was absolutely overwhelmed with the pitching in this league. He said, I thought that if I had to come in here and face this every year and look at this kind of pitching, that I thought this was going to be the hardest job I ever had. He said, <laughs> and then he said, last year, it wasn't so it wasn't really very good. I didn't think it was and he says but it's back this year. He says the pitching in this league is so good this season and I got to tell you Dave I, I really pretty much agree with you. Fly ball left center. That'll be taken by Merrifield. Two down and I, you know I, I agree with that certainly that I think that's a big reason why there's only one team in the top right, 80 in batting average in the division. country. I just it's just shocking. Usually this is a, a hitting conference. I mean there's been there have been good Friday night guys throughout my tenure of doing these games in the last 14 years. But I think that they're not only good Friday night guys now there's also good Saturday night guys. And I think this league has worked hard to find good closers. Most teams have a guy who can really shut you down in the bullpen as well. And not every team had that before. Matter of fact few had that. I think about Josh Fields last year, what Josh was able to do. I mean, I mean heck, he set a conference record, 41 career saves for him. And he'd just come out and just throw it 100 and say, hit it if you can. And I tell you, LSU's got a great uh, reliever and saver closer there in Matty Ott. Yeah, the freshman. The freshman yeah. that we saw early in the year who, who did not have a good day. We saw him, but uh, in, he's got 13 saves and now leads the Southeastern Conference in that category. And, He's going to be around for a while. I think that's a big reason why Lewis Coleman became a, an everyday starter as well, is that they found somebody down there that could get the job done. Well, I consider that. I mean, I mean, LSU's got a second guy, Anthony Ronaldo, who's pretty good. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I think a yeah. lot of teams yeah. in this league now have that combination. And usually it was just the top two or three teams would have that in the past, but I think most of the league has that now. I mean, even a team like Kentucky is not even here. I thought they had a pretty good Friday Saturday combo working. Paxton and Russell. Yeah. I mean, they they were outstanding. I, I mean, I would ask the coaches when I would talk to them during the week about the, the pitchers, and, and they'd all say to me, "Have you seen those two guys at Kentucky? I know. <laughs> they were they were amazing to watch." The problem was they had no offense. Right. They just couldn't score. But uh, but again, the pitching has been very very good this year. I agree with that man right there. I think Paul Maneri is absolutely right. I think the pitching is is much improved over last year. You know the, the power numbers though in this league Larry are still there. No I think they'll always be there. This league has uh, what four five six teams in the top 17 in terms of home runs in the country Alabama's fourth Auburn's fifth Georgia and South Carolina tied at eighth and LSU and Tennessee tied at 17th. Well that's not going to go away right I mean, they're always going <laughs> to get the good hitters and I was just rummaging through my mind how about Austin Hyatt at Alabama right. what a great year he had this year and, and you know old Miss's lineup I mean Nathan Baker and Philip Irwin Drew Pomerantz I mean they've got three really solid guys that can go out there and throw and of course we still don't know about Scott Biddle. I mean where he is with regard to his arm you know his injury he didn't play this weekend he was not on the roster the active roster for the tournament for Ole Miss but this is this is a very very solid group of uh, pitching prospects that I think Major League Baseball can look at yeah. and say you know the league has really improved in the pitching area. 
Two and two on Mitchell. Fastball misses outside. One thing about Nolan Belcher is don't worry about his pitch count. He's a guy that can throw you 115 pitches a game. He has 33. We're not quite out of the second yet. Popped him up. Foul down the line. We'll do it again. Dave, I was watching Jared Mitchell against Mike Miner the other night, the, the outstanding pitcher from Vanderbilt who had such a good outing against the Tigers. He really struggled with Miner. Uh, he really had him going. And uh, sometimes, and I've watched Mitchell uh, in some other games, also when we were down in Baton Rouge, but also some TV games. So he struggles a little bit with left-handed pitching. I mean, lefty on lefty really seems to bother him, nice. particularly the breaking ball. Hit him right on the helmet with a curveball and a 3 2 pitch. That's the second breaking ball that just didn't have the snap in it for Belcher. I didn't know if he, I don't know if he can't get a good grip on those seams tonight, but. but a free Mitchell pass. probably thought it had a little snap yeah. to it. <laughs> Hit him right on top of the helmet. Well, thank goodness for those hard helmets, huh? How about the guys? How about the guys who didn't play with the helmets back in the day? A lot of concussions. <laughs> or they were very quick. You, know? you learned to be quick. Oh, they had a pickoff out at second base. Mott took, I think, would have been out had Wingo been able to hold on to the ball. I agree. Well, what a nice turn. Let's watch this again. Ray Tanner probably a little upset. Look at this. I mean, if he catches that ball, he's dead. I mean, he has got him dead to right. He never gets back to the bag. I tell you what, that could have been interference on Wingo as well, grabbing the jersey. Surprised that uh, Montuk wasn't allowed to get to third base. Pop up down the right side. Jackie Bradley Jr. to the line. And the freshman puts a glove on it. So LSU will leave two. They pick up a hit. But we are scoreless after one and a half. See Paul Maneri talking to his troops. You know, he's a guy that's always teaching. And he expects the fundamentals to be taken care of. He doesn't want to have to he doesn't want to have to worry about that during the course of a game. He expects that to be in place and, and when the basics disappear, that's when he that's when he loses. You practice hard, you work hard, those things should be there. So he knows all Italians talk with their hands. Yeah. They always do. I think he's a little frustrated. His guy almost got picked off at second base moments ago, a little careless. I know I think it was last night one of his guys couldn't lay down a sacrifice bunt and he was not too pleased with the end result. I'll tell you what, he's one, he's one of the better teachers of this right. game that you will find anywhere. Here's Nick Ebert to face Lewis Coleman. A good matchup here to keep an eye on throughout the evening. These two guys, Nick Ebert's been just killing the baseball. Had four home runs last weekend against Georgia. Matter of fact, I think if I'm, if I'm correct, he had like eight of the 15 RBIs. Eight, he produced eight of the 15 runs South Carolina scored in over a two-game period at one time. I mean, he was just killing the baseball against Lewis Coleman, who threw six pitches in the first inning and had a strikeout. Ebert's numbers: 22 home runs. He ends up Nick Ebert tied for second in the league in home runs with Cody Hawn. He surpassed Rich Poitras right down the stretch. Oh, 
good fastball. That was an outstanding fastball right there. 92 miles an hour for Coleman. He's got a lot of poise out there, doesn't he, Dave? I mean, the way he sets up, breaks his hands, that step across his body. High fastball. 93 up around the letters, and Ebert can't catch up, so Coleman wins the first meeting. Well, that had some zip on it, too. Right up around the letters, maybe even a little bit higher. And the K line begins for Lewis Coleman. Here's Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey, the designated hitter. Jeffrey's been a hard luck guy this year in the sense that he was kind of projected to be their everyday first baseman when the season started, but Nick Ebert transfers in. And lo and behold, Ray Tanner thinks he's found something, and they just couldn't get Ebert out of the lineup. He started hitting the ball so well and playing some pretty solid first base. And so Jones has kind of been left to be the DH role in the everyday or the uh, kind of uh, spot player defensively. Jones 243 with 12 runs batted in. 0 oh and 2 on Jones. Ooh. One and two. It looked like a hard slider yes. coming across there. It looked like it started on the outside part of the plate and ended off the plate on the inside part. Andrew Crisp awaits on deck. Ground ball to second. Lene Hugh up. Two down. Andrew Crisp will step in. Andrew, 321. He's provided a little bit of pop in the bat this year in this lineup with 10 home runs. He also has 21 doubles this year, which is number one in the Southeastern Conference. One better than Stephen Little of Vanderbilt. Yes, he did go as they check down to A.J. Lestaglio down at first base. I think that's a pretty close. good call. I, I'm going to go with A.J. on that one. He's, he's your buddy. I understand that. <laughs> There's a chopper foul. 0-2. You see Andrew Chris, kind of the second Gamecock ever to lead the conference in doubles. The other was Steve Thomas back in 0-2. Thomas had 26, so good way to finish your career. Andrew Crisp, the senior for South Carolina, chases another slider. One, two, three, go the Gamecocks. Six in a row retired by Lewis Coleman, and there goes another strikeout. That, that is just an overwhelming slider. Great environment for the kids to come watch some college baseball. They're watching a pretty good one. About 25 showdown. South Carolina, well, back in 2004, this was a group that put it all together as they rolled to the SEC tournament final and take on Vanderbilt. Second trip ever to the final for the Commodores. Michael Campbell had a big hit. Davey Gregg also with a big hit, but it was the All-American closer, Chad Blackwell, that Got a double play to end the game as South Carolina defeated the Commodores 3 to 2 as the first and only SEC tournament title for Ray Tanner and the Gamecocks. That's the club that went on to finish third at the College World Series back in 2004. Talking to Ray Tanner a lot this year. You know, this has been a it's been a really kind of strange season for him because right as something would go well. Well, it reminds me of golf, you know, like when you drive the ball well, then your putting disappears that day. Or the day you putt the ball well, you can't, you know, you don't you don't hit a single green in regulation. Well, his pitching would be good, but then he would go, you know, five for 40 that night at the plate. Or his team would commit a couple errors. He could never put it together. But the last three weeks of the season, it all came together for that man. 
You know what? I, I remember back in the, the early part of this decade, I mean, in 02, 03, and 04, when he went to the College World Series, those three teams he had were just dominating. Of course, he had such a great career at North Carolina State, which is where he went to school. He was nine seasons up there and 13 seasons now coaching in South Carolina. It's hard to believe he's been here that long. You know? I, I, we, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, he's shocked. We're shocked. I mean, 13 years at South Carolina, and he's done nothing but win ball games. And I think that stadium that's built, Carolina Stadium, it's a testament to his success. Pop fly, right side. Who's going to call it? How about Jackie Bradley, Jr.? Almost at the second base. I think if Wingo would have stood still, he might have had an easy play. <laughs> hey, Tanner, number number 17, the world? Yeah, here. it's an out. So Nola is retired. And here's the top of the order in DJ LeMayhew. LSU were talking about South Carolina's only win in this tournament tournament championship was back in 04. How about LSU? I mean, this is a team that is, I think, built for tournament play, it seems like. They have uh, seven tournament titles they have collected. And they're trying to become the first team, as a matter of fact, to win back to back since Alabama did it. You uh, know, I think it was 02 and 03. SEC championships in league history. LSU just won their 14th Southeastern Conference title in school history last weekend. Throw that in with tournament titles. And Regular season championships. And oh, and by the way, they have won five college oh, world yeah, series I too. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. yeah, I just thought I'd throw <laughs> yeah, that I in. <laughs> I actually thought Georgia was going to win it last year after they won that opening yeah. game against Fresno State. Off the fist to second base, Wingo over to Ebert. Speaking of that tournament run, how about last year's tournament run? The tournament final a year ago featured LSU taking on Ole Miss. Matt Clark hit his third home run of the tournament, and then Blake Dean belted a two-run homer in a five-run fifth. And then who closes it out? Lewis Coleman. Six innings of relief. It was their first tournament title for the Tigers, by the way, since 2000 as they won 8-2 over the Rebels. And they extended at the time that league record winning streak to 20, and it would climb to uh, 23 games during the NCAA tournament. There's a line drive into left. D'Angelo Mack did make the catch. I had to wait for a signal from Ken Couch, who got out there to make the call. And he did. Good grab, D'Angelo Mack. Nolan Belcher loves it. Has to do the Gamecock faithful. We move to the bottom of the third inning. Scoreless one hit apiece. South Carolina and LSU. Arkansas, a winner earlier today. They send. What will be a disappointed Florida team back down to Gainesville and the Gators will await their fate in the NCAA tournament. I think, you know, you and I were talking that we think Florida is a team of certainly uh, pretty much a lock to host at least a regional. I think South Carolina is a team that has gotten back into the mix in terms of hosting perhaps at first a regional. I think that the fact that they have played so well down the stretch, they jumped into the top 25, they finished second in the Eastern Division. I think a good run here in this tournament, and it would be hard not to take them. And it's, you know, they've played good baseball. I think the record on the field speaks for itself, but it certainly wouldn't be bad to put a regional in that new ballpark. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. 
I'll tell you the one that intrigues me is Arkansas right now. I mean, here they are. They've moved on to, to play tomorrow. And uh, Fayetteville has been a favorite host yeah. city for the NCAA for a number of years. Doesn't necessarily mean that the host team has to be the number one seed. Right. I mean, you could send a team in there, some other team would be the number one seed, but certainly Arkansas has one of the finest venues in all of college baseball to host an NCAA tournament. To watch the evolution of the stadiums in this league in the 14 years I've been around it has been amazing. <laughs> I think about that first year doing baseball in this league and some of the ballparks we were going to and, and what it is now. Not that they were at that time you thought those were great and you never I could never in my wildest dreams imagine some of these palaces that have been built in the last six years seven years. Well, the, you know, both of these clubs have built just pal palaces is a proper word. I mean, South Carolina's got a new place. LSU's got a new place. And, folks, if you ever have a chance and you're ever in Columbia or Baton Rouge, just go by and look at two of the finest college baseball facilities in America. Fouled off at the plate. And he's driven up the numbers in attendance, too, Dave. Oh, I set a record, I believe, almost 1.7, 1.7 million or something like that. I think was the was the uh, in total. Oh, yeah. should, you should ask. We will give it to you. 1.754. The average is definitely up. It was a little over 4,000 last year. You know, you can't overlook the, the renovation that was done at uh, Oxford University Stadium, Swayze Field, over in. Uh, Ole Miss, you know, they didn't go the new facility route. They spent about half the money that LSU and South Carolina did and renovated their ballpark, and it turned out to be awesome. We had a chance to go over there for a weekend earlier this year. Another fastball up in the upper 80s by Coleman, and Kyle Enders goes down, and yet another strikeout for Lewis Coleman. It's fourth strikeout registered out there. By Coleman as again he goes up the ladder and that time he got Enders to chase one again above the ladders. So 109 109 strikeouts now on the year for Coleman off the end of the bat to Helen he across the diamond there's two down as Bobby Haney is retired. Is Coleman, Buckvich, and Hyatt. Ten wins, nine wins, eight wins. Coleman actually, uh, this is his 19th appearance, but only his 12th start on the year. Imagine that he'd been penciled in as a starter from the beginning of the season. On, he might have been up to around 13 wins, perhaps. It's a uh, it's fun to watch these guys develop. We saw Coleman last year a little bit and saw that he could be very good. Matter of fact, in that championship game, we just showed you a while ago, six innings, scoreless baseball. That's foul into the seats. And you can see the young man had the, the potential, but his offseason works on a couple of pitches, gets better control of them. The next thing you know, he's coming out here mowing down everybody in this league. Scott Wingo has been hitting it pretty well of late. Had a home run in that final series against Georgia in South Carolina. He was hitting around 168 when that series started last week. It's up around 209 right now. That's a strike. One and two on Wingo. front of the off speed pitch. So go 
fastball? I think so. Let's see what he does. It was a fastball. Fouled back. He got it up in the zone. You know, Dave, to this point, South Carolina's not been able to catch up with that fastball. But I've got a feeling if they keep going through this, turning this lineup over again, they're going to start to catch up with that fastball. He's going to have to start getting the ball down in the strike zone. He's been successful so far because they've just not been able to catch up with it. Here's a chopper to short. Nola over the first. Wingo retired. After the leadoff single to start the game by Whit Merrifield, Lewis Coleman has retired eight straight. We played three and we're scoreless. For a better life. You're watching Fox Sports South. Sun setting here in Hoover, Alabama at the 2009 SEC Baseball Tournament. It's Elimination Friday. Loser goes home in this one. We are scoreless, and the big reason is our two pitchers, Nolan Belcher of South Carolina and that man, Lewis Coleman of LSU, who has retired eight consecutive. And he has been uh, just off the charts all season long. Look at his ERA at 2.99. Opponents hit just a measly 2.11. And uh, you can add four more strikeouts to that 105. He has 109 now on the year, and his 10 wins, of course, lead the league. As we move to the fourth, I will turn it over to Larry Conley. Thank you, Dave Neal. And we do go to the fourth. 0 1 0. 0 1 0. That's what the line score says for both L LSU and South Carolina. We'll be looking at LSU's hitting order of the three, four, and five hitters Blake Dean, Micah Gibbs, and Mike, Mikey Matuk. Some of the crowd on hand. It's a nice evening in Hoover, Alabama. Here for game 10 of the SEC baseball tournament. Belcher's ready. He delivers a pitch on the outside for a ball. 1-0. One, oh. one of these two clubs is going to have to head home after this is over with. The other one will advance tomorrow to play the University of Georgia. LSU. The number one seed in this tournament finished up the season at least right now they are 42 and 16 but they finished up the SEC season at 20 and 10. They were co SEC champions with Ole Miss. University of Florida won the Eastern Division. The Gators uh, lost today. And they are on their way back to Gainesville. Ole Miss and Alabama have also gone home. There's a pitch outside, four pitches to Dean, and all four were balls, and he trots on down to first. They'll bring up Micah Gibbs, the catcher. Catcher number 33, Micah Gibbs. Here's the Western Division standings: LSU and Ole Miss again, co-SEC champions. Alabama finished up at 18 and 11, a good year for Jim Wells's club, and Arkansas, Auburn, and Mississippi State in the bottom half of the Western Division. Alabama played very well. They ran into some problems going to Auburn as Auburn beat them two out of three down there. And Alabama came back and won the Sunday affair. Finally got their bats untracked. Auburn's pitching was outstanding that last weekend. So Blake Dean's down at first for LSU. Micah Gibbs, the catcher, he was a strikeout victim. The first that Belcher got back in the third. Or excuse me, back in the second. South Carolina, the number five seed in this tournament, 38 and 20 right now. As we just showed you they were 17 and 13 in the SEC. There's that breaking ball that over the top curve. It's got a big hump in it. He throws it from about a three quarter uh, arm release, and then when it comes down, it comes shoulder to knee. 0 and 2 to Gibbs. Like Dean on first base with the first walk issued by Belcher. Breaking ball again. That one stayed outside. Gives a switch hitter. Really nice to have a switch hitting catcher. And Lafayette, Louisiana. 
Gets a ball toward right field. That is back and makes the catch for the first out here in the fourth. He gets the ball back in and Mikey Gibbs will head back to the dugout. Mikey Matuk, the center fielder, will be up. Yeah, I've been watching Belcher pitches a couple times. It's like the third time I've seen Belcher throw. And it's really it's been fun to watch him evolve. And you talk to Ray Tanner and Mark Calvey, the pitching coach at South Carolina. You, you know, they were throwing him out there into the fire because he needed to learn how to pitch in this league. And I think that's a lot about what the first half of the season was for him was learning how to pitch at this level. Um, you know certain guys you want to challenge certain guys you don't he's a fiery competitor and sometimes his emotion and he tried to just pump a fastball in on a guy that you know what don't pump the fastball in him it's okay if you walk that guy just learning how to pitch some guys never learn right and some guys can pump the fastball and they're not going to hit it but Belcher's not one of those guys he's got a really you know, he's got to work the zone. He's not going to overpower you. He's got a good curveball. He's got to change his speed. There's a weakly hit ground ball headed towards short. Cut off. Not cut off. No way the play was made. The third baseman came up with it. Andrew Chris had nowhere to go with the ball. You know, nine times out of ten, Larry, you say the third baseman needs to make that play. Always cut it off. It's the shortest route. In that situation, though, I think that that should have been Bobby Haney's ball. I think the angle by Crisp, he almost had to make a complete shoulder turn to make the throw to first, whereas Haney kind of attacked the baseball and would have had an easier play. Look at it. You know, nine times out of ten, that's the third baseman's ball. Yep. And that's the one time it's not. Good hustle that time. Matzo getting down the line. His second infield single, in fact, the only two hits LSU <laughs> has so far. Sean Ochenko, the first baseman, stands in with runners at first and second. There's a breaking ball inside for a ball, 1 0. I would agree with you, but uh, most of the time, the third baseman moving in that direction toward first base is going to make that play. But he had to go a long, long way to get that one. And the angle at which he was going as well. He was almost going away from first. Here's a strike. For the Tigers with runners at first and second now. Pachinko with a good year. 326, 44 runs batted in, seven home runs. Looks at the pitch on the outside part of the play. A slow curve just caught the outside corner. Chinko the junior plays first base tonight catches occasionally he and Micah Gibbs have kind of shared that position behind the dish so Belcher's ahead in the count one and two high fast ball foul back Jared Mitchell will follow Chinko one down here in the fourth we've got nothing but goose eggs up there Couple of infield singles for LSU. Ma took has both of them. And Whit Merrifield started the game off for South Carolina with a single. And he was a race on a double play, so it has been all pitching at least to this point. Nolan Belter and Lewis Coleman putting on a good exhibition of good strong arms. And two guys that are total opposite in their physiques. Yes. <laughs> one's five eight and the other one's six three. There's a breaking ball. Headed toward third. Picked up. Chris throws it across, and there's the second out. Both runners advance. So Chinko's down, third to first. Two away. Both runners advance. Dean moves to third, and Matuk is down at second. Jared Mitchell, the right fielder, stands in. He was hit by a pitch, hit in the helmet, which sent him to first base back in the second. He was left stranded. Mark Calvey out to talk to us. Pitcher Nolan Belcher. Mark probably calling this game tonight. Sometimes when Justin Dallas is behind the plate, Justin uh, will call the game. They will let him call the pitches. 
But with uh, Enders in there, I think, and, and a young pitcher like Belcher, I think Mark Calvey probably making those calls here tonight in that South Carolina dugout. Dave, what do you think about the decision of Jared Mitchell to give up football and just concentrate on baseball? Pretty good move on his part? Well, I, I think he realized where his future was, and that's a decision that he made. Sure. You know, absolutely. we talked about in that first game. About so often, guys that are talented and can do two sports, they're not the ones making the decision. It's somebody else taking away that opportunity for them. But I think in this case, Jared Mitchell made the decision that this is where my future lies if I want to be a professional athlete. And I don't have a problem when, when, when the student athlete makes that call. I just hate to see a college kid. So we lose sight of what college is about a lot of times. You know, we get caught up in this big business, this fast paced world, and a lot of times, hey, you know what? The kid's a good football player. May not be great because he doesn't spend 100% of his time there, but he's good. And if he's a good baseball player, why not play both? Here's Belcher's third pitch, fouled back into the net by Mitchell. Well, the other thing, too, is that, uh, and, and you would know this better than I, that uh, LSU's got a lot of good wide receivers. Well, they've had some talent. <laughs> <laughs> and I, Mitchell was one of them, yeah. you know? Two down here in the fourth. Nolan Belcher trying to get out of this mini jam he's created right here. There's a strike on the outside corner, and it goes to two and two. I've, you know, I've been here for a little over a day now, and I would say of the, let's just say 50 people have stopped me to talk to me about stuff, 45 have involved football. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> Here's Belcher's 2-2 pitch. Outside goes full. You know, this is one of those situations where you can really kind of pitch around Mitchell. Yeah. And you got Helen Nehe who's coming up next, who had that big pinch hit three run homer in the seventh inning to send Alabama home. But kind of pick your poison here. Which guy do you want to pitch to? And right now, Belcher's gone full with Mitchell. Let's see what he wants to do with this pitch. Got him. Good fastball. Down and in, and Mitchell chased it and missed it. Well, LSU put two runners on. They stranded a runner at third. They stranded a runner at second. South Carolina will come back. Good pitch by Belcher right here. He ran the fastball in. A little pump of the fist by Kyle Enders, the catcher. He continues to pitch well, does Belcher. It's the 2009 SEC Baseball Championship. We are Regions Park in Hoover, Alabama. Number two LSU in the number one seed in this tournament taking on South Carolina ranked number 25 and the number five seed. There we are in South Carolina's dugout right there. They lost a tough one this morning. Approximately 1.30 a.m. to a Vanderbilt squad that has moved into the semifinals of this tournament undefeated along with the Georgia Bulldogs. And right now we're trying to determine who the other team is going to move in and play. We've already got Arkansas in there. Georgia and Vandy are both undefeated and one of these two will go home and the other one will move on. Whit Merrifield who has the only hit so far. But Lewis Coleman has given up. Coleman delivers a high fastball for a ball. Coleman has faced the minimum after Merrifield got on through a single. He was erased in a double play on the ball hit by D'Angelo Mack. Which is down low for a ball. Two and up. Merrifield with that leadoff single extended his, his, his hit streak to 10 games. Coleman rocks and delivers. Merrifield hits it to straightaway center field. Matuk comes on, reaches up and easily gloves it for the first out here in the fourth. I bring up the left fielder, D'Angelo Mack, as I indicated, hit him with a double play back in the first. Mack with a terrific year, leads this team in hitting with a 364 average, second in home runs, second in runs batted in. He has had a terrific year. The junior out of West Columbia, South Carolina. Sends a foul ball to the left side. 
Angelo Mack, a guy that came in here hot. He had a 17 game hit streak heading into this tournament. It has been since snapped this morning. Well, he has been a, uh, a guy that's really kind of gutted it out throughout his career and gotten better each year. Another foul ball to the left side. Oh, a two. Coleman continues to work ahead against the hitters at South Carolina, and I think it's one of the reasons why they have kind of kept off balance by this big rangy 6-3 or 6-3 thrower out there. You can see right there, and hits to Angelo Mack with 84 on the year. He is the third Gamecock to lead the SEC in hits. Angelo Mack hitting from the left side. Coleman's ready. Here's that step across his body. Ground ball headed toward first. Nice pickup down there. Ochinko grabs it, tags the back, and here's the second out. So Max retired. Two up and two down here for the Gamecocks as Jackie Bradley Jr. stands in. The right fielder struck out back in the first inning. He was the first strikeout that Coleman registered. He's got four on the evening so far. There's a strike on the outside corner. Coleman looks very relaxed out there pitching into the fourth inning here. So a number of quality starts this year. This is a very solid and very poised pitcher. I think the deception of his delivery is what causes a lot of problems for for a batter's day the way he comes across. I mean he hides the ball so very well. I don't think batters really pick the ball up until he's made that complete turn. It's a pretty good shot right here. We, we may want to stay with this and watch and see well, it's from the first base side. If we could get it from the third base side, you'll get a good look at how he steps across and actually steps toward that third base dugout. There's a foul to the left side. I think that is obviously he has a lot of movement on his ball and he can throw his fastball in the early 90s. But I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that it's really hard to, to get a good look at that ball leaving his hands. Here's the 2-2. Fastball -two. inside. He runs the count full to Bradley. Nick Ebert, the first baseman on deck. Ball hit fair right over that first base back. Bradley turns first. He's heading into second. He'll coast in there with an easy double. Nice piece of hitting that time by Jackie Bradley, his 11th double of the year. Pachinko reached for it. It was just barely out of his grasp as he went right over that bag. And it was fair maybe just by inches. Yeah, you know, I think that probably fooled maybe Ochinko a little bit. It was hard to tell how hard that ball was hit. It always is the sound on this on these bats is generally the same. But he was able to sneak it underneath the glove, and Bradley Jr. can flat out run. This freshman has got a load of talent. There are so many good freshmen in this league. Nick Ebert takes the first pitch for a strike. Ebert, the junior, junior college player out of Central Florida Community College. Ray Tanner's been known to select a number of quality junior college players to play for him. That says Paul Maneri. Both guys have utilized the junior college ranks. This is the matchup I was looking forward to tonight. The red hot Nick Ebert, second in the league in home runs against Lewis Coleman. The first, the first round went to Coleman, who struck out Ebert. Got him on a high fastball. Got him to chase that pitch. It was up and out of the zone. You can see Ebert with that exaggerated crouch. And Coleman's ready. Just missed. He gets right on top of the plate, Larry. He just gets down low, makes that strike zone appear to be a lot smaller, and tries to take away the inside part of that plate, making that zone 
so much tighter for pitchers, giving him an opportunity to really be selective at the plate. Foul back into the stands over the South Carolina dugout about eight or nine rows up and the guy makes a good catch. You know the first couple of years you and I came over here we challenged our fans to show us what you got. And that ball goes into the stands. Let's see some catches out there. That was a good one. Maybe we can reestablish that you think. Two and two. Well, my boys will be here this weekend, so let's not start this year. <laughs> Low and outside, count goes full. You're witnessing two of the better performers in the Southeastern Conference in the world of college baseball, Lewis Coleman. Dave indicated one of the best pitchers in all of college baseball, and He's facing one of the best hitters in all of college baseball. Here's the deciding pitch. Got him again. Call strike three. Right over the inside part of the plate for the second time in a row. Nick Ebert down on strikes. Breaking ball. Got him on a hook. Oh, that was nice. Coleman's won those two. No score. Well, that says everything right there. That line score of 0 2 0 for both clubs. Some excellent pitching so far. Nolan Belcher and Lewis Coleman squaring off, and it has been nothing but a pitcher's duel. Hitters are really struggling to get something done. How about a flashback to some other players? How about Aaron Hill, the 2003 SEC Player of the Year? A great year with Toronto. He's hitting 340 at this point. Aaron Hill, another one of those good players that played in Baton Rouge. He was the 2003 SEC Player of the Year. But then they've had a few Players of the Year out of LSU. A lot of Tiger fans on hand here. We always get a good turnout at the SEC tournament from the folks of the state of Louisiana. And speaking of that, let's go down and watch Gary Kalanihi, the third baseman. He looks at the first pitch for, for a ball from Nolan Belcher. I remember Aaron Hill. What could he hit? There's a high fly ball to left field. Mack drifting back right in front of the track, and now he's still he's kind of staggering a little bit out there. Going left, going right, coming forward. But he made the catch. One down here in the fifth. That wind is just something terrible out there tonight. And that's exactly what D'Angelo Mack was talking about. That that wind is swirling up above the stadium. Getting uh, updates that we're having gusts as much as 20 miles an hour. Austin Nola, the shortstop, looks at the first pitch for a ball. Delter to this point has given up two hits. Mikey Ma took both of them infield singles. There's a pitch that misses for a ball, 2 0. Everybody else on this LSU squad has not been able to deliver a hit. Jared Mitchell got on by getting hit by a pitch, and Blake Dean walked, and it's the only base runners that they've been able to, to put out there. 2 and 1. And we were threatened with a little bit of rain. We thought we were going to get some tonight, but we understand that it's moved south and is heading toward Montgomery. We'll let the state capital handle all that. Two and two. Nola hitting out of the nine hole. He'll be followed by P.J. LeMahieu. You know, Nola's been an interesting story, Dave. Since they inserted him in the lineup at shortstop, they have been winning and winning a lot of games. He sends a fly ball to center field. Merrifield coming forward. The wind's got it, and he makes the catch. These outfielders 
This isn't a routine day for these guys. Not only is this a big ballpark with a lot of room to cover, but these pop flies that get up in the air like that and have a lot of hang time. Well, you better stay on it and not take your eyes off it for a any amount of time. DJ LeMahieu, the second baseman, 0 for 2. Well, the other thing too is that you know when you get fly balls like that, it makes you leery. I mean, you right, you, you get a gun shot. Yeah, you you, know, you look up there and say, all right, now which way is it going to go? You you know you lose that comfort level of knowing you've got it in your glove. There's a strike one and one. Belts are looking very calm, very relaxed, very poised to this point. Well, it was an off-speed pitch outside, two and one. Mayhew with that upright stance. Sends a foul ball to the right side out of play. Yeah, the one thing about LeMahieu, and I've talked to the coaches about this, they talk about his even keel and his personality. He, he never gets too high, never gets too low. A really good clutch performer, though. Gets a lot of balls to the right side. Here's the 2 2. Got him. Belcher gets him. So once again, Nolan Belcher continues to perform. That is his third strikeout of the game. He gets LeMahieu lo looking, and we will move to the bottom of the fifth. Well, we've got a good pitcher's duel here. Once again, LSU and South Carolina locked up in a good one here in the Southeastern Conference Baseball Championship, the 2009 version at Regents Park here in Hoover, Alabama. Lewis Coleman with 10 wins on the season, the most wins by any pitcher in the Southeastern Conference. He has been terrific. 110 strikeouts with the five he's got tonight. And there's a man that's matching him pitch for pitch. Nolan Belcher so far has had an awfully good outing. He has registered three strikeouts. And these two guys have given up only two hits so far this evening. Right now, Lewis Coleman will be facing the middle of the order, the five, six, and seven hitters for South Carolina. Jeffrey Jones, the DH, Andrew Crisp, the third baseman, and Kyle Enders, the catcher. Jones stands in, Coleman's ready. The 6-3 frame rocks, and he delivers. Outside corner for a strike. Go figure, he throws a strike. I think that's nine out of 18 first pitch strikes. Nine out of 19, maybe. Here's the 0 1. Belcher. Oh, foul back, 0 2. Belcher was 9 out of 8 out of uh, 18, I believe, for Belcher. And it's 10 out of 14 first pitch strikes for Coleman. We've got him with 53 pitches so far. We're talking about Coleman. We got a six pitch first inning with a strikeout. One and two. There's that slider hit right down to the third first baseman Ochenko. He grabs it, steps on the bag, and there's the first out. So Jones is gone. It brings up Andrew Crisp, the third baseman. Third baseman number two, Andrew Crisp. Chris went down on a terrific slider back in the second inning. He was the third strikeout victim and ended the second inning. There's a fastball high and outside for a ball. One and oh. Three twenty on the year for this senior. He has been a terrific player in his career in South Carolina. There's a foul ball hit down the left side. One and one. 
And he's a guy that is a classic program guy. Whatever needed to be done, wherever he needed to play, Andrew Crisp was the guy. Out of Greer, South Carolina. He's not too far from Clemson, as I recall. Here's Coleman's 1-1. Swing and a miss on an off-speed pitch. There is no question that Coleman's best pitch tonight has been his slider, and he set it up with his fastball. I mean, his fastball has been good, but these guys haven't even come close to hitting that slider. We may get a good angle here to, to, to watch him step across his body. Now watch that right leg. He goes straight across, and he comes right back. Nice grab. Comes up throwing. Got the second out. Lewis Coleman fielding his position gets crisp as he goes down to up to down the catcher Kyle Enders. Kyle Enders. Another slider got him out but you know that lead foot that left foot is going right toward the LSU dugout. He's been good. He has been, he real has good. been very good. Fastball ball high and outside. One no. I mean, you just don't win 10 games without being pretty good, you know. I mean, he came into this game throwing 90 and a third innings. Before the season's over with, he will have thrown over 100, in it, 100 innings. And I always think it's of interest to me that when a guy steps out of conference play after all the scouting reports are done and everybody's had a chance to see him throw and they know what he does now he will face up against some of the other competition in college baseball outside the SEC I think a lot of teams are going to find him very perplexing and very tough to hit here's the one one fouled back into the stands one and two you know, also with the evolution of college baseball, Larry, in the last decade or so, the amount of games that are on television, you're, you're able to scout a little bit more. Now, these clubs don't send out scouts like big leagues clubs, but you have tape, you have video you can go to and learn how to pitch certain guys. And I think uh, LSU does a great job in that department. Well, most everybody now has a staff of people that sit around and break tape down. You, there are no secrets. I mean, by the time you get midway through the season, most of these games are being televised and televised, and a lot of people who break these tapes down are able to show you the minutia, if you will, of pitching. You know, the, the little the little tricks that they have. So this guy is just simply coming at you with a good fastball in the high 80s, low 90s, and a wicked slider. Let's see if and he throws an occasional changeup. Got him. Right down the heart. Enders was looking for something breaking. He got him with a fastball. Three up, three down. I could put that on tape for Lewis Coleman. <laughs> yeah. He has looked magnificent. We finished five. Put him in the books. Your teams, your network, Fox Sports South. For those of you who have been with us since the beginning, no reason for you to leave now. This is about <laughs> as much fun as it gets in a college baseball game. And if you haven't been with us and you're just joining us, we're seeing a great pitcher to Lewis Coleman right here with a nice slider. He has been terrific. Most of his stuff has been breakers, and most of it has been the fastball up. He's gotten the game cost to chase a lot of pitches. He has struck out six. On the other side, Nolan Belcher has been terrific, too. This is our Arby's game summary. It is Lewis Coleman and Nolan Belcher to this point dominating this baseball game as both of these guys have given up only two hits. No runs scored so far. And this little guy right here, all 5'8", 155 pounds of him, is battling Lewis Coleman pitch for pitch as we move to the sixth. Ryan Schiff, the left fielder, stands in. He looks at the first pitch for a strike. Hey, this might be as entertaining the first five innings as we've had all season. These two guys have been remarkable. Here's the 0-1. It has been the best pitched first five innings we've had all season. No, no question. question. Yeah, it's, these guys have been really, really good. Schiff in the hole, 0-2. He is 0-2 tonight. 
And we're talking about these guys are doing it against good hitting teams. South Carolina came in here just pounding the baseball. Here's Ray Tanner. His club built, you know, their park, whether it was the old Sarge Fryer and the new Carolina Stadium, his clubs have always been built for power. They've had home run ballparks. You're not going to see a lot of stolen bases from South Carolina. They're going to get a guy on and try to hit the two run or three run blast. You know, Schiff trying to get a gapper here if he can. He is known for his gap hitting. Here's Belcher's delivery. Got him. Outside corner. Rack up number four for strikeouts for Nolan Belcher. Well, Belcher not to be outdone. Goes fastball, paints the black on the plate. He's throwing a lot of curveballs, and I think that some of these LSU batters are waiting for that. It's kind of been his out pitch. And a good call from Mark Calvey, bringing the heat. Here's Blake Dean, the designated hitter. A little outside for ball, 1-0. Oh. How about Belcher? He's had eight fly outs, four ground outs, and four strikeouts. Coleman on the other side, one fly out, eight ground outs, and six Ks. You know what this points up? That you can pitch a game in a lot of different ways. And you got Coleman in there with the overpowering stuff, and Belcher is just working these guys to death. Pop up to the left side. Chris wandering over near the stands. It's about eight rows up. Not only is their physical stature different, but also their pitching approach is different. We've seen Coleman with that hard slider and a very moving fastball and an occasional change. But it's Belter using all of his pitches and really spotting the ball a lot more than I think Coleman does. Coleman just comes at you. Belcher likes to move it in and out. Here's his pitch, just outside for a ball. That was his 90th pitch of the game. But like I said, he's thrown over 100 a few times. It's not a big deal for him. Matter of fact, you know, he's coming off a game where he threw, I think, a, just a shade over 100 pitches in six and a third against Georgia, which is a lot of pitches for that. But he had 11 strikeouts, a career high in that game. Picked up the win against the Dogs. Two weeks earlier, he picked up a win against Vanderbilt. Went seven and a third, had five strikeouts in that one. Here's the 2 2. Ground ball heading to left field. Base hit. Now Dean delivers the first base hit out of the infield. As he goes down to first base, he'll bring up Micah Gibbs, the catcher. The catcher number 33, Micah Gibbs. Well, Blake Dean's just a hitter, folks. That's what he does. And he shows you a good, he took a, he took what was a bad pitch and turned it into a positive. And if Blake Dean start, continue, I shouldn't say start, continues his tear like he has over the last 30 something games where he's hitting 377 and drove in a, a, drove in a ton of runs. If he continues on that tear, that is just going to be a huge lift for LSU. There's a ball headed toward right center in the gap. On the warning track. Picked up out there by Merrifield. Here comes the runner around third. Here's the relay. Not in time. Blake Dean scores the first run of this evening. Give Micah Gibbs his 34th run batted in and his 13th double. Back to back hits for the number three and number four guys in this LSU lineup as Gibbs extends his hit streak to 11 games with this double. Got a pitch. A little bit outside, but up in the zone. Had a little backspin on it and died right in front of Whit Merrifield. And Blake Dean knew from the moment that left the bat that, that was going to get in. So he did not hesitate and he was able to score all the way from first base. Mikey Ma took stands in now with the runner at second base. Gibbs with a short lead. Excuse me, swing foul ball back into the stands, 0 1.
Tell us your team can strike quickly. LSU with four hits. Matuk has two of them, and neither one of them have left the infield. Runner in second now, runner in scoring position, and only one out. One and one. Nolan Belcher in high school, Larry, went 47 and 2. He had 516 strikeouts in 282 innings. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That gets, Ball gets past the catcher. Enders couldn't find it. He looked down and it was already behind him about 15 feet. Moving over to third is Gibbs. He reached down and there was nothing down there. <laughs> Got by him about 20 feet and Gibbs is in scoring position. See how Ray Tanner plays this with his defense. He's going to bring him in. He wants to shut off this run if he can. Here's the 2 1. Strike inside corner. Good pitch. Attacked Ma, took with an inside fastball. Dave, that's what I'm talking about. This, he works the inside half and outside half of the plate as well as anybody. You set up, you look for an outside pitch, you'll come inside like he did then. Here's his 2 2. Ground ball up the middle, base hit. So Gibbs scores the second run of the evening. LSU takes a two to nothing lead. You know what? He got what he wanted, the ground ball. He just happened to hit it right back up the gut. And I mean, you're, you're begging for a ground ball there if you're not going to get the strikeout, and he got it, and it's just past the glove of Belcher. And another RBI for Mikey Ma took that's 27 and then how about the third hit of the game for Mikey. Well, I like the way this guy plays. How about Ma took Dean and Gibbs. That'd be three four and five in the lineup. They're four out of eight today with a couple of RBIs. The rest of the team 0 for 13 with three K's. Hard to fault Nolan Belcher right now. He's only given up five hits. And only one extra base hit. And he's thrown 98 pitches to this point. I think the coaching staff at South Carolina as Mark Calvin heads back to that dugout, they would love for him to get out of this inning before they have to go and get him. Sean Ochenko, the first baseman, 0 for 2. Still only one down. There's a strike. Ma took over first base, eight of 11 in stolen bases this year. Belcher would love to elicit another ground ball. This one preferably one of his infielders. Chinko having a good year. 326 coming in. There's a shot to left field. Mac back. He's got it measured. He's got it in his glove. Two down. I think these outfielders like it when the ball's hit kind of on a line. They got a pretty good read on it. It's the ones that get up high above the tree line that have been causing these guys all kinds of problems today. There's the story with Belcher at his pitch count. 100. As he is one out away from getting through six innings. And they bring up the right fielder, Jared Mitchell. Mitchell was hit by a pitch back in the second and struck out in the fourth. Ma took with a pretty good lead over there. There he goes. They've got him picked off. The throw down. Got him. Touch stealing. Mikey Ma took. 
Good play by Belcher that time. The toss over to the first baseman, Ebert, and the throw down to Haney, and he applies the tag. But not before LSU put two runs on the board. They had three hits, nobody left on. Let's go to the bottom of the sixth. There's a shot from the right field camera, straight down the line toward home plate here in Hoover, Alabama, the 2009 SEC Baseball Championship. LSU just got two runs. South Carolina has yet to put anything on the board, and Ray Tanner would like to see his offense start to perform. They've only gotten two hits so far this game. Record of 38 and 20, 17 and 30, second in the East, and a lot of that day came at the end of the season. They are currently ranked number 25 by Baseball America. A good RPI, 23, won 11 of their last 13 games, 26 and 9 at Carolina Stadium, their new home. Right now, they've got their offense up to the plate, and they just, they will start with their shortstop, Bobby Haney, then their second baseman, Scott Wingo, and then the top of the order in Whit Merrifield. The center fielder. Haney hitting in the eighth spot. On the left side, first pitch comes in for a ball. Coleman working his sixth inning. To this point, six strikeouts registered by Coleman. He's retired in the last four in a row. And the foul ball to the right side. 101. You know, Haney has been a really good find for Ray Tanner. Think about the infield South Carolina had last year with James Darnell at third, Havens at short, and Justin Smoke at first base. You know, you could have argued that the Pedro Alvarez, Ryan Flaherty, Alex Feinberg group at Vanderbilt might have been one of the best all around infields, but I would argue that, you know, you could make the case for South Carolina's group, but. Ground ball headed toward first. Machinko with an easy play on the bag and one down. But I, I just think Second that, you know, replacing a shortstop is is difficult, especially the, the kind of shortstops Ray Tanner's brought in. Reese Havens last year was just a sensational year. 06 and 08, the all-conference shortstop. And just not only could he make the plays defensively, but he was a heck of a hitter. As a matter of fact, you know, in minor league ball, in double A, I think it's double A, he already has seven home runs. That's two more than Justin Smoke already has. Wow. You see that stretch by smoke right there? Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely love that, that guy. Good right you know, oh <laughs> that's good infield. That's good infield. You know, and it always, I, I got the SEC book this year, and I was looking through it, and I, I started looking at the all SEC baseball first team last year. First of all, here's a fly ball to left field. Schimpf is in pretty good shape. Underneath of it, staggers a little bit, but catches it. And Wingo is the second out. So two up and two down here in the sixth. But anyway, I was looking at that book and I, and I looked on there and I saw Rich Poitras. And I was looking at his numbers and I said, how could he not be first team? Oh, that's right. Justin Smoke was first team. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, Smoke is, uh, you know, as Ray Tanner and I talked about a little bit last week about, you know, certain guys are just pro hitters. You call them that. Chipper Jones. The guy's just a professional hitter. It's what he does. Justin Smoke, same kind of guy. He's just a hitting machine. Here's Merrifield. Takes a half swing, called a strike, going one. Witt's got one hit. He is one for two tonight. <coughs> but the player of the year last year at shortstop was Gordon Beck. Oh, I mean, my goodness gracious. I mean, great arm, great range, could hit the baseball. They've had a good ones, a lot of good ones flow through this league. One and two. Merrifield looking for his second hit. Here's the one two pitch. Popped up right side. Ochenko over near the South Carolina dugout, but it's just behind the dugout. You know, you mentioned Gordon Beckham. Ironically, he plays right here with the Birmingham Barons in this ballpark. And remember, we talked about Josh Fields earlier, Georgia's unbelievable closer the last couple of years. Those two actually met a few weeks ago, and Beckham doubled off Fields. Probably will never let him forget you know, it either. You know it. <laughs> he probably sent him the baseball. Here's Coleman's one, two. Shot towards short. Good pick up by Nolan. Throw across, got him. Pretty play. 
Flashing some leather out there at short. Nicely done by Austin Nola. He's now retired seven straight. Lewis Coleman has. The right hand, right hander has been dominant. Oh, Nola with a good play here. Let's go to the seventh. Two to nothing. In favor of the Tigers. Well, the night is over for Nolan Belcher. He threw six innings, gave up two runs and five hits. Certainly a quality start on his part. As he was able to do what he needed to do against the Tigers, kind of held them at bay. A very good hitting squad. We've got a new pitcher on the mound, Dave, Adam Westmoreland. Yeah, Adam Westmoreland, a big guy, left-hander coming in. His job is to throw some strikes. 6'5", 280 pounds of freshman. Out of Case, South Carolina. The story on Westmoreland, 4.4 ERA, 4-2 on the year. He has started actually six games this year. He has come out of the bullpen. This will be his seventh time out of the bullpen. He has given up 22 earned runs, 45 strikeouts, 30 walks. Opponents hit 236 against the left-hander. He will face Jared Mitchell to lead things off. Well, while you're in the flow, just go ahead and take it. All right. Look at your snack. <laughs> Here's Westmoreland first pitch. Whoa heads up. Is everybody all right over that dugout that just skimmed right over the top of the dugout. Everybody seems to be OK. And little man he's not crying because he got hit he's crying because he didn't get the ball. I must be big brother's not going to give it to him. One and two the count. Jared Mitchell was actually up at the plate. Last inning for LSU but that was. Well Mikey Ma took. Was caught stealing. Two and two the count. Jared today is hit by a pitch. Got hit right on the helmet with a breaking ball that didn't necessarily break. So I guess it wasn't a breaking ball. I guess it was just a soft pitch. More like a changeup. Westmoreland misses after getting ahead in the count. He's now behind three and two. Here we go with the payoff to Jared Mitchell. To third, Andrew Crisp. Got him one down. This has been this has been a very well played baseball game. One of the best I've seen in this tournament in a while. We've seen outstanding pitching for both Lewis Coleman and Nathan Belcher, but we've seen some pretty solid defense. On both sides. Matter of fact, DJ LeMahieu ended the inning. The shortstop for LSU last time with a nice pick at short. And misses a little bit low to Derek Helenihi. Helenihi was a big spark for LSU yesterday, keeping the dream alive. And this is what it was. Boom. Propelled LSU to the win over Alabama. Third ball upstairs. Ellen Ehe with three homers on the year. He's flied out twice today. Two and one to count. Line to center. Merrifield. Whoa! Wit! <laughs> He's got a little smile on his face out there thinking oh my gosh. That could have been. More than just trouble. <laughs> He's looking. That ball. Was inches. From getting over his head. I mean he took those three or four steps in and all of a sudden he's going oh I'm going in the wrong direction. <laughs> 
I don't care what sport you've played, you've always been in there where your body's going in one place and your mind saying, this is not where I should be. <laughs> <laughs> Westmoreland having trouble getting that breaking ball in for a strike. So George and Vanderbilt back at their hotels getting ready for tomorrow's action. Vanderbilt already knows they're going to lock horns with Arkansas. Georgia awaits the winner of this one. The sixth and eighth seeds are 2 0 in the tournament. There's a look at uh, the story for tomorrow 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Central. And then, of course, after that, we'll say roughly 2 30, 2 45, it'll be game two. Now, if Andy and Georgia win, they head right to the championship game in a winner take all scenario. But if LSU or whoever wins this game, LSU or South Carolina, they got to win twice tomorrow. And the same to, can be said for Arkansas. Merrifield, excuse me, Haney across the diamond. Good inning for Adam Westmoreland out of the bullpen. One, two, three, go the Tigers. Two nothing LSU over South Carolina a top 25 showdown one of these teams will play tomorrow one will go home. But it has been a very entertaining baseball game We've had a good crowd tonight on a cool crisp evening. The wind has been blowing in in an overcast day but as uh, Larry and I have said on more than one occasion to each other during these commercial breaks. We will take this after spending so many years in 95 degree weather and humidity at 95 percent. This has been a real treat. I would leave this turn and look like a lobster. <laughs> I've seen you leave a lot of places looking like a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> or looking for a lobster. <laughs> Oh, the good times. Lewis Coleman has been dealing since the opening pitch of this game. Lewis Coleman has retired seven straight. And you can stop the streak now. D'Angelo Mack with the third South Carolina hit of the evening. A good start to the Carolina seventh. Just right back up the middle. Good, good job by D'Angelo Mack. A lot of times you get in these situations, and I hear coaches talk about it, guys begin to press. They're looking for the big shot. They're trying to get the team back in the game with one swing. D'Angelo, being a senior like he is, understands that this is not a one swing type of game. Not against Lewis Coleman anyway. I say senior, D'Angelo a junior. Here's Jackie Bradley, junior, the freshman. Out of Prince George, Virginia. Looks at a strike, one and one. should be uh, South Carolina but the first time through the order one hit four K's pretty much the same thing for the second time. It wasn't Ar Arkansas hit the ball pretty good today. He scored 10 runs. If they could score 10 runs against Lewis Coleman that'd be something. One and two the count. This could be two. It was hit that hard. Six, four, three. Got him. How about that work by Austin Nola down at short? This kid has got a great glove. First baseman, number 47, Nick Evers. Hey, I go back and tell that story about Nola. He's become a real fixture in the starting lineup at shortstop. They move LeMayhew to second base to get him out of there. In the last 18 games, LSU has been on fire, and a lot of it has been the fact that Nola has done such a great job playing that shortstop position. That was well played 
all the way around the diamond for LSU. And you know, that's a tough break, break for Jackie Bradley Jr. The problem is you're not going to double him up much, but the problem was he hit it so hard. There's Nick Ebert who struck out twice against Coleman. First two rounds to Lewis. Round three goes to Nick Ebert. Fourth hit for the Carolina squad tonight. And here's Jeffrey Jones, the designated hitter, will step in. Jeffrey Jones will step in with one home run on the year. Jeffrey Jones thought he might have gotten hit by the pitch. Ray Tanner comes out. Talking to our home plate umpire Jeff Head. <laughs> Jeffrey Jones points to his left leg like that ball hit him. He was getting ready to take off. Very hard to tell from that angle. I couldn't tell whether the ball got him or not. Strike to Jones. That misses one and one. Let's watch this one more time and see what happens. It's a breaking ball. Coleman slider again down and in. And I just thought it was just a good pitch. One and one the count. There's a fly ball left field. Ryan Chimp back pedals. That's the third out. So the Nick Ebert single goes for not. It was a nice double play that helped LSU out of the inning. We have played seven. Your teams, your network, Fox Sports South. We're back at Regents Park in Hoover, Alabama. There's Lewis Coleman throwing a nice little four hitter right now against LSU. But how about the Gamecock pitchers? They've thrown a nice little five hitter. As this LSU club is poised to make another deep run into the NCAA tournament. They love to keep playing here and go back to back in terms of the SEC tournament championship. Ranked number two in the country in Baseball America. Declared co-champions in the SEC along with Ole Miss. They did take two of three from the Rebels during the regular season. NCAA RPI is 10th. Adam Westmoreland working here in the eighth for South Carolina in relief of Nolan Belcher, who put together a fine performance tonight. The freshman left-hander. That curveball slapped heads up. Into the seats again. Fly ball down the right field line. Long run for Jackie Bradley Jr. and he won't be able to catch up to it. Oh, and to the count to DJ LeMayhew. Fastball way outside. Breaking ball, bad hop. Well, that just ate up Chris. LeMahieu on his way to second. The throw from Mack, not in time. 
LeMayhew hustling down to second. Dave, that was an outstanding play right there. Once the ball got by Helenihi, I'm sorry, once it got by the third baseman over there in South Carolina, Andrew Crisp, and got into left field, he was almost determined to get to second base, and he has got great speed. They're going to call it an error on Andrew Crisp. That was just a uh, the no man's land hop on him. So LeMahieu at second. Watch LeMahieu in real time. Book it around first base. Just good hustle. Bringing the energy. You know, he's a big guy. He's 6'4. He can motor. He's got a stride. You know, two strides and he's at first to second. Now LeMayhew is over at third. Well, that looked like Enders was looking fastball, and he got a breaking ball the way that Enders didn't really move the mitt. And that's I think that's what they're talking about right now. The question is, is this a wild pitch or a pass ball? Well, that ball was moving, wasn't it? Count to Ryan Schimpf. Three and one. South Carolina's infielders in. They're going to try to cut this run off. Now with nobody out, Ray Tanner, here comes Mark Calvi out to the mound. Do you still play the infield in? Do you try for maybe the double play and keep it from a, being a big inning? Or do yeah, you? I've, I've got to cut the run off. I would keep the infield in because uh, you've given up two runs right now. And the way Coleman is pitching, good chance they're not going to score a lot of runs. So uh, and You're down to six outs. I agree with that. Yeah. Westmoreland in relief of Nolan Belcher, the freshman left hander, gives way to the other freshman. <laughs> and Westmoreland, who is from right there just outside of Columbia, kind of a hometown product, getting the pitch for his hometown university. Mark Calvi now in his fifth year as the pitching coach for Ray Taylor. Tanner will leave the infield in. They are not going to allow that, or at least attempt not to allow that third run to come home. I'll tell you what I do right now. I put Chip in motion. But you're in a world of hurt with Blake Dean at the plate, followed by Micah Gibbs. That's the combination that produced the first run. Blake Dean singled and Gibbs doubled to bring in Blake Dean back in the sixth inning. A lot of speed on the base pass right now, first and third.
And we have talked about the improvement he has made since the first month of this season. And Larry, I mean, here we go. These are updated numbers in the last 35 versus the first 23. 231 to 379. 12 homers to two homers. I mean, it's just. He's just been a tough out. Marlins getting himself in more trouble here. I mean, um, he got it. It really was not his fault that the air was committed over at third base on the ball that was hit to Crest was pretty sharp. But he walked uh, Shemp, and now he's in trouble with Dean at three and one. And now he's loads him up from Micah Gibbs. Moreland and the Gamecocks in a world of hurt right now. Fastball and therefore a strike. That's two pretty good fastballs right there. He got it up to 91 and 94. Gibbs took the first one and he was late on the second one. Activity in that South Carolina bullpen. Well, he got away with a high breaking pitch right there. I thought Gibbs was going to jump all over that one. Gibbs doubles, and that would score Blake Dean for the first run of the game. is loaded down in the dirt here comes a play at the plate Enders can't come up with it runners move up to second and third and LeMayhew able to touch home plate it's now three to nothing LSU out in front let's watch this again see what happens Wild pitch down in the dirt. Boy, Enders hustled over there as quickly as he could. He just couldn't come up with the ball. I don't think if he'd have come up with it and made a good throw, it was going to be a good. It would have not been a close play. I thought LeMahieu was in there easily. Now it's three and two. Still nobody out here in the eighth. Got him looking. Dave, I gotta tell you, his three best pitches right there to Gibbs were all fastballs. He nibbled a little bit with the breaking pitches, but it didn't work, and he came right back. It might have been a little bit of a hard slider right there. He came in there pretty quick with that ball. Boy, that was a good pitch. So Westmoreland will now try to get Mikey Ma took. 
Check swing, foul straight back. Ma took his last time up, single, picked up an RBI as he scored Micah Gibbs, but then he was picked off to end the inning. But Ma took three out of three today. Good breaking pitch. Boy, did he take a lot off of that one. Westmoreland has thrown 25 pitches this inning. Curve ball. Little blue. Here's the play at the plate. Wing goes through. Got him at the plate. And now the uh, infield can go back to regular distance, but a heck of a play by Scott Wingo not to panic. That ball had a lot of spin on it. First baseman, number 14, John Chico. Dave, that was a very close play. It almost looked like that he got underneath that tag. Watch Schiff again from third base. Wingo very quickly getting over there and didn't hesitate. Yeah, he got him. It was a good call. Here's Sean Ochinko. Blake Dean is now at third. With Ma took over at first. Fouled off at the plank at the plate. Westmoreland now ahead 0 and 1. David, if he were able to get out of this with just one run being scored, it would be remarkable. Considering the fact that they had the middle of their order up there. She's locked in. She's trying to get a picture of Larry Conley for all the tabloids. <laughs> she would be disappointed. <laughs> nice off speed pitch from Westmoreland. 0 and 2 on Ochinko. Remember, LSU had the bases loaded and nobody out. See, she got the picture of you there, and she was smiling. She was very happy about that. She got you laughing. I'm going to bet she's the mom of somebody out there on the field, you think? Yeah. Ochinko delivers a two-out, 0-2 base hit. Here's a play to third, over the head of Chris. Now here's a chance to get the third out, and they'll say safe. But a run scores as Blake Dean touches home plate. But an 0-2, two-out pitch that is delivered to right field for an RBI single for Sean Ochinko. Give him 45 RBIs on the year, and it's now four to nothing. Mark Calvi on his way out to talk to his pitcher. There's the base hit. Go the other way with it. He got one up around the letters and. Ochinko just guided it into right field. Big base hit right there. There's a big difference between having a three run lead and a four run lead. Well, how about Bradley coming up throwing? This was very close here. I thought maybe he was going to get him on that tag. And we're going to have a pitcher's change. So, South Carolina has allowed a couple of runs to come into score. And they now lead it four to nothing. We'll come back, update the change. Stay with us. Well, we've got a new pitcher on the mound for the South Carolina Gamecocks. His name is Stephen Neff. Neff will stand in. The left hander, a six footer, 185 pounds. He's a red shirt freshman. From Lancaster, South Carolina. Stephen on in relief. He is the third pitcher to be used by the game cuts. Here's Ray Tanner over there having a conversation with Westmoreland. Looks one sided. 
Here's Neff's record, only his third appearance of the year. As you see, he has no record, no earned run average. He's only pitched one inning. He's given up two hits. So we don't have much of a paper trail right now. <laughs> no. On Stephen no. Neff. We will find out about Stephen right now. Right fielder, number three, Jared Mitchell. Uh, this is the third straight freshman left-hander we have seen tonight from Ray Tanner's bunch. And he will face Jared Mitchell. There's Lewis Coleman who's been sitting around. This has been a long top half of the eighth inning. You wonder what kind of impact it'll have on Lewis when he comes back out. He's throwing a nice little four hitter through seven. Jared 0 for 2. His average has dipped down to 328. Second and third, two down. That base hit by Ochenko was the first of the inning. They have uh, two runs and still two runners on, but they only have one base hit. That single, of course, it was a big one, a two out RBI single. And, you know, you think about it, there's two out in the inning. This, this whole thing got started by the error at third base. This inning should be over. Two and two to Mitchell. is over but two important runs for LSU they stretch their lead to four bottom of the eight coming up Baseball game as we bring you our Arby's Arby's game summary. Mike Kimato, three for four today. Only four hits tonight for the South Carolina team that had 11 in the first game, 10 in the second game. They've been certainly quieted down here tonight. Lewis Coleman's been the story, really. I mean, he has been almost unhittable. Nolan Bet Belcher, the freshman, has put together another strong outing. Three of his last four performances have been very impressive. His only hiccup was up in Knoxville. Matter of fact, Sam Dyson, the Friday night starter, and Belcher, the Saturday, they both got just hammered by the balls. First pitch fly ball off the bat of Crisp is a routine catch out in right field from Jared Mitchell. Catcher number 18, Kyle Enders. Mitchell has struggled tonight at the plate. He's had a tough time against all the left-handed arms. Of South Carolina. Boy, it's been over a year since this Carolina team has been shut out. You have to go back to April 5th of last season. And that was against Georgia, and it appears that Ray Tanner making a change. Due up is Kyle Enders. Now, remember Justin Dallas, who's been pretty much the regular catcher of late, did not start. It was Enders who got to start behind the plate, but I see Dallas down in the bullpen area, so. I don't know what the situation is. Now for South Carolina. And it will Number be a pinch hitter as Brady Thomas comes in. Brady, the junior transfer, transferred in from Florida State out of Anderson, South Carolina. And welcome to the game. You get to face Lewis Coleman. 
Enders, that, remember that pass ball that allowed that run to score, that fourth run? Enders came up, and he had a grimace on his face. I wonder if he might not have tweaked something. Mm, could have. First pitch, fouled straight back. Thomas, this is just his 19th game that he's played this year. Only uh, twenty four plate appearances on the season. Looks at ball one, one and two to count. With a one oh five. Has a couple of hits, 19 official at bats, but he does have five walks. And he has struck out six times. Two and two on Brady Thomas. Hammered. That ball is touched. And that's out of here. Home run, a pinch hit home run for Brady Thomas, his first home run as a Gamecock. A 105 hitter just took Lewis Coleman deep off the scoreboard. How about the move from Ray Tanner? How about the swing by Brady Thomas? I mean, Coleman has had his way with these South Carolina hitters tonight, but not this time. Boy, Thomas came off of that pinch or that bench, and he was ready to pinch hit. He nailed that ball. Bobby Haney steps in now. Wow. Just reading the ground ball to first base. That'll be taken by Sean Ochinko out number two. But just reading the media guide on Brady Thomas, obviously not a lot, as you say, paper trail on Brady. Transferred in from Florida State. It says, surprise and fall drills after transferring from Florida State. Has a knack for putting together quality at bats. <laughs> just did. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> and it looks like he'll put the gear on. Two down in the inning. Here's Scott Wingo. He lofts one into shallow right. Long run for Jared Mitchell. He's able to put a glove on it. So, Lewis Coleman makes a mistake. But he gets out of the eighth. South Carolina picks up a run. But as most coaches will tell you, the solo homer is not going to beat you on most nights. But a good look and swing from Brady Thomas. It's 4-1. Lewis Coleman. Just another day at the ballpark for Lewis. Trying for his 11th win, Dave. You know, anytime you get around nine wins in the college baseball season, you're doing well. He has been very impressive. Justin Dallas now back behind the plate. Derek Kellanini, first pitch he sees from the left hander, Stephen Neff. A redshirt freshman out of Lancaster, South Carolina. Right back at him, slow roller. Wingo should make a play on it, and he does. One down. Shortstop, number 36. Austin and Austin Nola. Nola will step in. Wingo, a guy you just see there, he's, he's in there for one reason. It's that leather in his left hand. He is a tremendous defensive player. Now he wasn't a big, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't hit for much 
in high school either. You know, I mean, that's, that's not been his forte. You've just known that he's been like a vacuum out there at second base. He's been uh, steady all season long. Doesn't he look? He looks like he looks like a guy that play, could play baseball every day of his life. <laughs> I tell you what, he's got a little pop in his bat though. He's got four home runs and five doubles on he, the year. He cracked one in last weekend in Columbia, South Carolina, deep into the right field. Popped up. Who's going to make the play? Wingo. There's that leather we're talking about. Right on cue. Thank you, Scott. So you feed the guy the love and he shows it back to you. Comes you know back. I mean? Comes right. back. Twice. Twice. Isn't that what saying? <laughs> Dave, you're a great humanitarian. Yeah, that's what I pride myself on. I think a lot of people see that in me. Fastball upstairs from Neff. Back to the top of the order and DJ LeMayhew. He got all that mess started back in the eighth inning. That misses low, 2 0. Oh. Yeah, it was a pretty well hit ball to third and it just kind of handcuffed Crisp. It was kind of an awkward hop and it got past Andrew and that opened the floodgates for a two run eighth. Strike two and one. You know, Neff has come on and retired the three batters he's faced. Three and one to LeMayhew. Full three and two. <laughs> Lost him. So the Mayhew will wind up. For the second consecutive inning over at first base. And here's Ryan Schimpf. Ryan 0 for 3 today, had a walk, but was thrown out the plate on a fielder's choice. Looking at some numbers, Larry, and this doesn't bode well for South Carolina fans, but let me just throw it out there anyway. LSU is 37 0 when leading after eight innings this year. <laughs> There's always a chance, though. Always a chance. That's why they played the game. Right. Here's a ground ball. Let's see if Wingo can make all three outs. See? Because I pumped him. <laughs> Gave him a lot of love this inning, and he performed well in the second baseman. Now South Carolina is going to need a big offensive inning. They're down to their final three outs. LSU fans thinking they might see yet another complete game from that man, Lewis Coleman. He is gunning for his third complete game of the season. How about once again, look at the strikeouts, Larry. Six to nothing against the Walks. On the season now, he is up to 111 strikeouts and 19 walks. Coleman, 95 pitches, 
He has thrown of the 95, only 17 of those have been when he's been when he's been behind in the count. That's how much he has been aggressive, getting ahead of these guys and keeping them off balance. The only guy he didn't fool was Thomas who hit the home run. And I think Thomas went up there with the right approach. Remember, he came off the bench as a pinch hitter and he swung at the first pitch. I'm just going to swing. He's going to throw it around the plate. I'm going to keep swinging. I might hit one. Here's Whit Merrifield, top of the order. Whit trying to square up, maybe sneak on via the bunt. Good news for Carolina. It is the top of the order. But they need some base runners. I'm sure that Ray Tanner's instructed his hitters to go up there and take a strike before you start swinging. But the way Coleman's pitching, maybe the best pitch you might get will be the first pitch. Two and one on Merrifield. Witt today. Single to start the game. And I think I found my recall. That might have been the first pitch of the game. Now three and one. The danger of walking his first batter. We've jinxed him. He'll take a deep breath on a 3 1. And I'd be willing to say this might be his first 3 1 count of the afternoon or the evening. Might be. Got him. 3 and 2 now. Now I'll tell you what, he had Nick Ebert on a 3 2. That's right. And struck him out. Yeah, that may have been that was a 3-2 on Ebert. Foul back. I can't write. I, I think I, I that very well may have been his first 3-1. Okay. Three and two here. Yeah, he got Ebert twice. Here's a little ground ball back up the middle. LeMay here. Safe at first. Whitfield, Merrifield beats it out as that's his second hit today. And now the leadoff man is on base. Merrifield didn't hit it hard, but hit it in the right spot. Tough to get him. If you hit a ball that slowly back up the middle, even as good a second baseman as LeMayhew is, Merrifield gets down that strike really quickly. Head down, barrel to the bag. You see those arms pumping? Four six three double play back in the first inning. The 31st double play they grounded into, but not this time. Back up the middle. Merrifield on his way to third. He will get in there safely. First and third now. And you just wonder how much longer Paul Maneri is going to go with Coleman. And here comes Coach Maneri. Uh, he's got Matty Ott out in the bullpen, Dave. That's been a lethal combination all year. Why not go to it? It's been your bread and butter. We told you when they lead after the, the eighth, LSU is 37 and 0. And one of the reasons is Matty Ott out of that bullpen. And Lewis Coleman with another fantastic outing. Some of the people who are not even LSU faithful are standing and applauding that effort. We'll step aside, update the change when we come back.
Well, Paul Maneri has opted not to go with his closer, Matty Ott. He's reached down and grabbed a guy by the name of Chad Jones, a 6'3", 222-pound sophomore out of Baton Rouge. He has been a combination outfielder and pitcher, and he has been driving Paul Maneri crazy all season long to let him pitch. So he's letting pitch, and he's done a really good job. His fifth appearance of the year, while his ERA is at 5.4, it's been spot duty for him. They've asked him to come in to pitch one out, maybe two outs, but he's got a good, lively fastball and a pretty good breaking pitch. So Chad Jones on in relief for LSU. Yeah, but safety for the LSU football team. Last year at 46 tackles, played in 12 games, had an interception. But Lewis Coleman, at least to this point, has been the story. This slider has been dominant tonight. He has gone eight and changed, seven hits, six strikeouts, no walks. Of course, the two runners on base belong to him. But one earned run was off the uh, bat of Thomas, a home run. Back of the eighth. So here's the tying run at the plate in the form of Jackie Bradley Jr., a lefty-lefty matchup. Nick Ebert on deck. Second in home runs in the conference this year is Nick Ebert. Jackie Bradley Jr. has gone deep nine times. Two and zero oh on Bradley. Two ninth inning wins this year come from behind wins for South Carolina. Can they make it three? They've got a chance. Nobody out. Runners at first and third. Three and one on the freshman right fielder for South Carolina. Bases are loaded. Paul Maneri, I just watched him and he put his head in his hands. And now he's going to go out again. And this time I think he's going to go get Matty Ott. And he's going to do that. Jones was in there for one batter, lefty lefty matchup, and he lost. Jackie Bradley Jr. So here comes the closer. Matty Ott, the freshman, will try to close the deal for LSU when we come back. Almost had to guess that eventually he was going to come around to this. Matty Ott, the Southeastern Conference's leading save man, is now on. He has 13 saves on the year, which ranks him number one. He's already got one save in this tournament against Alabama as he stands in. This freshman right hander can really deliver pitches. At 6'1, 180 pounds, the freshman is out of Metairie, Louisiana. Chad Jones, as Dave said, was in there for one reason. He was simply to go lefty-lefty. Matty on, on now in his 32nd appearance. You can see his earned run average of 2.32. What he wants to do right now is just simply throw strikes, get out, and get home. Matty Ott on in relief, Dave. Of course, Matty Ott, half of the freshman of the year team. The other half belongs to... Uh, Preston Tucker. Of course, Preston, we uh, saw earlier today, the first baseman for Florida out of Tampa, Florida, had a great year. Had a freshman record, 77 runs batted in. And how about Ben Jones, the Scholar Athlete of the Year? 3.8 GPA for the Auburn Tigers in mechanical engineering. 
But Matty Otto takes center stage. Bases loaded. How about this matchup? Bases loaded, nobody out. The winning run steps to the plate in the form of Nick Ebert, who is tied for second in the Southeastern Conference with 22 home runs. He is fifth in RBIs with 71. And he steps in against the freshman. That look says a lot. <laughs> oh, and two. Is that a nasty slider or what? Out of the strike zone, and he went after it. Nick Ebert coming off a four home run weekend to finish the regular season of four long balls against the Bulldogs back in Columbia. Fastball just misses outside one and two. Two and two. Just a little too quick with the bat. Yeah, he was thinking fastball from the get go and got out way in front of that fastball, which came in at about 88 miles an hour. Strikeout tonight for Nick Ebert. Well, Matty Ott got him out in front. Just simply took a little off of it. Good breaking pitch down and out of the strike zone, and Ott couldn't get it. That was a good pitch. Here's the DH, Jeffrey Jones, step again. 0 for 3 tonight is Jeffrey. Bases loaded, one down. <laughs> Guys, five through nine in the South Carolina lineup are hitless tonight. And that's where Jeffrey Jones stands in this order. Number five. On deck is Andrew Chris, the senior. Line. Could this be two? Oh, had LeMayhew gone to first, he would have had the double play. But there are two down in the inning, and now a pinch hitter coming up for South Carolina. Michael Roth. The freshman out of Greer, South Carolina, will step in against Matty Ott, trying to close it out. The freshman came into the game with the bases loaded and nobody out. Can he get out of this jam? The winning run is at the plate.
Roth on the year hitting 167. 167. This is just his 13th game he's played and he only has 12 at bats. There's a strike. 0 and 1. Roth, two out of 12 at the plate this year. Two. <laughs> Everybody's a little jumpy right now in the ballpark. <laughs> Watch the swing again. A lot of people standing right now in Regents Park. Two and two. This ball game could be over with one swing of the bat. Or it could be over in a flash if Ott can get it over the plate. And he did. LSU holds on to win it. Four to one over the South Carolina Gamecocks. What a baseball game in, in Elimination Friday. LSU stays alive after losing their opener on Wednesday. They lose a win yesterday and come back and win here tonight. Four to one behind a fantastic performance from Lewis Coleman and then Matty Ott out of the bullpen. How about that combo? Is Ott fired up? You bet. Bases loaded, nobody out. <laughs> And he sits down the Gamecocks one two three since he came into the game. That's a freshman the co freshman of the year in the league. And so LSU will live to play the Georgia Bulldogs. Tomorrow in game number two. Well, South Carolina actually out hits LSU. Seven to six. LSU improves with the win to 43 and 16. And meanwhile, South Carolina will head back to Columbia 38 and 21. They perhaps missed out on a chance to sneak in as a regional site host. They would have had to play well into the tournament to probably pull that off. But they win it today, four to one over South Carolina, and LSU moves on, and they will play tomorrow. Well, joining us down in that third base dugout in front of. Uh, his bench is a happy. I see a smile right there, Coach Benary. Hey, Dave Neal, Larry Conley with you. I'll tell you what, great baseball game tonight. Wasn't it? And, 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 and you, you've seen it over and over, but a lot of people probably maybe haven't seen Lewis Coleman pitch. Talk to me about what you see every time he takes them out. Isn't he something? It was a great ball game. I mean, all, all throughout the game, I thought their little left-hander Belcher was great. Yes. I thought Coleman was great. You know, the hitting wasn't awesome, but there was uh, some good situational stuff, some good defense. But, uh, you know, when we give the ball to Coleman, we know for a fact that he's going to go out there and compete as hard as he can. And he throws that sinker, and he's got a little slider, and he just competes. He throws the ball over the plate all the time, and our players just have such confidence in him whenever they, uh, they play behind him. 
him. Paul, this is Larry. I, hey, you Larry. know, I, I'm absolutely amazed at the poise that Matty Lott has for a freshman, <laughs> for him to step out there. I mean, he leads the Southeastern Conference in saves. He got thrust into a position there with nobody out and the bases loaded, and he looked like a veteran. I gave him the old line, Larry. I said, hey, this guy's a really good hitter. Don't give him anything good to hit, but you got to throw strikes. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you're coming in with the bases loaded, nobody out, and a kid that's got 22 home runs and uh, I said look just don't let up if you fall behind in the count just keep it keep throwing it as hard as you can and uh, hope for the best you know let's try to get a double play ball here and don't worry about it if we give up a run or two but he's an amazing kid he's been something I don't know where we'd be without him this year all right coach one final question before we let you go and that is uh, you know in these tournament situations you're getting the losers bracket a lot of talk about arms I know you know really two and change pitchers tonight where are you with your staff you got <laughs> enough arms to go the rest of the way you know when we lost the opening game I told the kids after the game, don't think in terms of winning this tournament. It's too overwhelming. Let's just win one game. And after we won one, let's win another one. And that's how we're going to approach tomorrow, too. Right. I think we've got some arms. You know, some other guys are going to have to step up for us. Bradshaw will start tomorrow uh, in game one. Hopefully there'll be a game two, and we'll see who's left after that. But, I, you know, I, hey, look, you know, we've, we've used our top two guys. There's no question about that. But these other guys could be counted on, you know, down the road. So it's time for them to step up and help this team, too. All right, Coach. Thanks for giving us. That's a good one tonight. That was All great. Right. Paul Maneri, head coach of LSU. His club will play tomorrow. We will see the purple and gold of LSU back inside Regents Park. Fantastic night of baseball. A couple of teams stay alive. Arkansas and LSU. They will take on Georgia and Vanderbilt tomorrow. We will bring you both of those games beginning at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Arkansas and Vandy up first, followed by Georgia and LSU. Stay with us as the 2009 SEC tournament continues. For Larry Conley and the rest of our crew, this is Dave Neal saying so long, everybody, and we will see you tomorrow.